This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Thousands of Palestinians inside the Green Line territories have taken part in a protest to mark the ninth anniversary of Al-Aqsa Intifada. The protesters condemned the racist policies of the Israeli occupation against its Arab residents. In the village of Araba, the protesters held banners condemning policies of the Israeli occupation and calling for national unity. In observance of the ninth anniversary of Al-Aqsa Intifada, the national blocs inside the 1948 territories declared a general strike. Thirteen young Arab men inside the Green Line territories were killed during Al-Aqsa Intifada. None of the officers or soldiers accused of opening fire at the Palestinian demonstrators has ever stood trial. Joining us from the town of Araba near Jenin is our Al Arabiya correspondent Rima Mustafa. Rima, how are the protests going in Araba? Yes, Mohammed. As you mentioned earlier, the high follow up committee of the Arab national and popular blocs inside Israel declared today, October 1st, a day of general strike. A general strike was declared in observance of the ninth anniversary of Al-Aqsa Intifada and in protest against the Israeli practices facing the Palestinians inside the Green Line territories. The response has been great in the various Arab villages and cities. Thousands of residents took part in today's protest in the village of Araba, which is one of the triangle villages of Land Day. Thousands of Palestinians inside Israel from the various political and popular blocs took part in today's massive protest. As you mentioned earlier, the protesters condemned the Israeli judicial system for failing to prosecute members of the Israeli police force who opened fire on Israeli Arab protesters. Thirteen Palestinians from the 1948 territories were martyred in these incidents, which took place in October 2000. However, none of the suspects has ever stood trial despite the legal recommendations in the case. The Israeli court issued a final decision to exonerate the Israeli police under the pretext that the officers acted in self defense. To the Palestinians, the protest aims to counter fundamental Israeli policies, which include land seizure inside the 1948 territories and the judification of Galilee and Negev, in addition to the ongoing attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque. Can we say that today's event in Araba was was able to unite the political rivals in the Palestinian territories? Yes, today the Palestinian factions formed a united political front. As you mentioned earlier, the High Follow-up Committee for Palestinians in the 1948 territories is a political umbrella for all popular and political blocs inside Israel. The committee always tries to bring unity among the various political blocs, especially on a day like this. The protesters held similar banners and slogans in the name of all the political blocs inside the 1948 territories. In the end, they're all facing the same policies, the policies of the state of Israel. Rima Mustafa from the village of Araba near Jenin, thank you very much. The prisoner exchange deal between Hamas and Israel is to take place on Friday. The deal was the outcome of efforts exerted by Egyptian and German mediators. According to the agreement, Israel is to release 20 Palestinian female prisoners in exchange for a videotape showing that the captured Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit is alive and well. The deal includes several female prisoners whose jail time is about to expire. Only one prisoner is from the Gaza Strip. Our correspondent in Gaza, Zuhair Saqqallah, gathered the reaction of a Palestinian family who 
whose daughter, Fatma, along with her child, received the promise of freedom. The feeling of joy was evident at the home of the Al Zik family. This comes after the family received news of the release of their daughter, Fatima, and her child, Yusuf, who was born inside an Israeli jail. Fatima will be released in a prisoner exchange deal between the Palestinian resistance factions and Israel. The deal was brokered by a joint Egyptian and German mediation team. According to the deal, Israel is to release 20 Palestinian female prisoners in exchange for a videotape of captured Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit. We are experiencing great joy, especially considering that we will be able to see baby Yusuf, who is living with his mother in prison. We have not seen Yusuf during our prison visits. The one-minute videotape was captured after the latest Israeli war in Gaza, and it shows the condition of the captured Israeli soldier. The videotape will be delivered on Friday to members of the mediation team, who in turn will hand it over to Israel. Upon receiving the videotape, Israel is to release the female prisoners. This simple deal is a precursor, God willing, to a comprehensive deal. As we mentioned in our statement, we hope to complete a comprehensive deal that meets the conditions of the capturing groups as previously stated. The deal is an exchange of information for the release of female prisoners. This may open the door for similar deals or even a comprehensive deal that will finally meet Palestinian aspirations. I think that the German mediators have played a major part in the brokering of this deal, which was announced by Hamas and Israel. While some described the deal as an important achievement, others described it as a humanitarian gesture. Meanwhile, Israel announced that they are still far from reaching a comprehensive deal with the Palestinians. It seems that all this talk about a comprehensive deal is useless, as it will not help to lift the siege being imposed on the Palestinians. Zuhair Sakala, Dubai TV, Gaza. Representatives of the Red Crescent Society met today with the jailed female terrorists who will be free tomorrow as part of the deal with Hamas to release a video showing that kidnapped soldier Gilad Shalit is still alive. IBA's Ellie Wagelander has the latest on that story. While all Israel eagerly awaits tomorrow's release of a videotape proving captured soldier Gilad Shalit is alive and well, one female Palestinian prisoner has already been let go. Nineteen more are set to be released after the tape is handed over to Israel, expected tomorrow morning. Two Red Cross representatives interviewed the 19 prisoners at the Hasharon prison this morning. Nineteen of the 20 are from Judea and Samaria, one is from Gaza. None of the women were directly involved in the killing of Israelis, although a few were directly involved in attempted stabbings. The vast majority had already served two-thirds of their sentence and were scheduled to be released within the next two years. Last night, Bara El Malki, 15, who was convicted of attempted manslaughter and whose sentence was to be completed by November, was returned to her parents' home in the Jilazun refugee camp near Ramallah. Malki's release was the first of a Palestinian prisoner since Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu took office on March 31st. One partial reason being given for the current breakthrough in negotiations for Shalit, who has been held in captivity for 1,194 days, is centered on a copy of the Psalms and prayer book. Two weeks ago, Interior Minister Eli Yishai handed over the books for delivery to Shalit to Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak during Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to Cairo. Mubarak gave the books to Egyptian Intelligence Minister Omar Suleiman and asked him to make sure that they reach Shalit. Till now, Hamas has refused to transfer anything to the captive soldier for fear that Israel would take advantage of the situation in order to try and locate him. This time, Hamas agreed to give the books to Shalit. Uh, the fact that Israel is willing to pay a heavy price should not be misconstrued by the other side as a sign of weakness, but on the contrary. And uh, what we have done today, the cabinet decided on a uh, gesture, which is a humanitarian gesture, and uh, the whole issue should be dealt on a humanitarian basis. According to one of the sources involved in the talks, further developments are expected soon, but the road to completing the deal is still long and many obstacles and difficulties are expected. 
Israeli officials said last night that the tape slated to be handed over to Israel is one minute long and shows the kidnapped soldier with his face to the camera. The video will also include proof that it was taken recently. Ellie Wargalanter, IBA News. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today told the cabinet that Israel would not be able to take any more risk for peace if we are not able to defend ourselves. Netanyahu was referring to the Goldstone report, which the prime minister said will damage the fight against terror. Netanyahu also instructed Defense Minister Ehud Barak and Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman to devise a plan to tackle international lawsuits against Israeli officials resulting from Goldstone's report on the Gaza war. The foreign ministry today briefed foreign diplomats and journalists on Israel's strong objections to the Goldstone report. This report is really a, uh, an attack on the state of Israel. It's an attack on its leaders, in its, uh, its attack on its people. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Taub said, an attack on our uh, legal system, this is totally unacceptable. So you cannot really, that's what I'm trying to convey to the Palestinians, they cannot hold the stick in both hands. They cannot try and talk peace and attack us on the other hand. This is, we see it as a frontal attack. Palestinians are not only following up on the release of 20 female prisoners from Israeli jails, they're also following news about settlements. According to Israeli media, more than 11,000 settlement units will be built south of East Jerusalem. This Israeli settlement plan shows that Israel is ignoring all calls to stop settlements because it is the largest settlement project in Jerusalem. It will house more than 40,000 settlers. A new settlement project was revealed in the media as the largest settlement surrounding Jerusalem. The residents of Walja village were deeply concerned for many years, even before this huge Israeli settlement project was made public. Israeli authorities have taken measures to prevent Palestinians in the village from expanding horizontally and to demolish any home built without a license. Now the village will lose all its agricultural land, which will be used for building this huge settlement project, which will house more than 40,000 settlers in this area in southwestern Jerusalem. The village of Walja alone will lose more than 4,000 dunams, which will be used to build the settlement. According to existing Israeli plans, the village will be surrounded in all directions by Israeli settlements. The village will be isolated from other Palestinian areas. This Israeli plan known as Metropolitan Jerusalem aims to expand the borders of Jerusalem. This will be done by adding more land from Palestinian villages to Jerusalem and building a series of settlements which will then become Jewish neighborhoods. These settlements are designed to isolate Jerusalem from the West Bank. This intends to displace approximately 24,000 to 27,000 people from Bethlehem's suburbs. They will be suffocated by settlements and eventually forced to move out. They're taking advantage of the Palestinian people. They do not look for a middle ground solution. They claim they want peaceful settlements, but the settlement plan proves otherwise. They want this land for their nation. This plan shows that Israel believes that building settlements in Jerusalem is not illegal and wants to establish it as a reality on the ground. Israel is building 14,000 settlement units. This means that a great amount of land will be confiscated from the residents of Walja village, which was occupied in 1948. These settlements will link Israeli settlements in West Jerusalem with settlements in East Jerusalem. From Walja village, Dalia Al-Namari, Nile Television. Iran and the Five Plus One group of countries have wrapped up their meeting in Geneva with Iran calling on world powers to respect the rights of all countries to peaceful nuclear energy. Alongside global efforts for nuclear disarmament and the demolition of weapons of mass destruction, we think it's necessary for all states to have the right to peaceful nuclear energy. 
We believe in order to have full global nuclear disarmament and for every country to have the right to peaceful nuclear energy, we need to move towards the slogan of nuclear disarmament for all and peaceful nuclear energy for all. Earlier in the day and during the meeting, Jalili underlined his country would not give up its right to peaceful nuclear energy. Meanwhile, EU foreign policy chief Javier Solana said Iran and the 5 plus 1 had agreed to hold another round of talks before the end of October. A meeting at the level of deputy heads is planned before the two sides meet by the end of this month. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton described the talks between Iran and the 5 plus 1 as productive. She said the country's meeting has opened the door for positive and constructive talks between the two sides. Still there, Iran's foreign minister says the Geneva talks between Iran and the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany were held in a constructive atmosphere. Uh, Chair Motaki, in a press conference at the UN headquarters, expressed hope that the two sides will enter the second round of talks based on the, the same approach. He also said that uh, negotiations can be held at a higher level. The foreign minister again defended his country's right to enrich uranium as part of its peaceful nuclear program aimed at generating electricity. Motaki earlier visited the Pakistani embassy in Washington to inspect his country's interest section there because Iran does not have diplomatic relations with the United States. The International Atomic Energy Agency has thanked Iran for providing information on the construction of its second uranium enrichment plant. In a letter obtained by Press TV, the agency has asked Iran to continue its cooperation with the IAEA and provide further information on the site. The letter, signed by the director of the nuclear watchdog's safeguards department, also requests that the agency be given access to the facility. Ten days ago, Iran informed the IAEA it was building a new uranium enrichment plant south of the capital, Tehran. The announcement was made 12 months earlier than required. Now, Tehran has also said it will allow the IAEA access to the facility soon. The Iraqi Prime Minister announced today the establishment of the State of the Law Alliance. The announcement of this coalition party, set to run in the upcoming legislative elections, was made in an official ceremony in the Al Rashid Hotel in the Green Zone. The State of the Law Coalition has more than 30 political groups, all led by the Dawa Party of Nur al Maliki. New alliances are becoming more defined as the upcoming parliamentary elections near. Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki has left his coalition party, the United Iraqi Alliance, once headed by Abdulaziz al-Hakim. He decided to embark on a new path with this party. The new coalition is called the State of the Law Alliance and is composed of political leaders and a diverse array of members from a wide range of political parties. Honorable Iraqi people, the State of the Law Coalition represents all Iraqis and aims to achieve the common aspiration of establishing a strong, independent, secure, and prosperous Iraq. God willing, with its unbiased national technocrats and programs, it will undertake this responsibility shortly, which requires additional effort and sacrifice. However, there is information about lengthy talks between the Al-Maliki coalition and other influential parties in Anbar, Mosul and Salah al-Din. So far, the State of the Law Alliance party has never won any support in these areas. For example, it does not have the tribal party that was once led by Abu Risha in Anbar. It also failed to attract al hatba party, which is important to win Mosul. The door, however, is open to these parties and others. The door is even still open to the possibility that the State of the Law Alliance may join the United Iraqi Alliance. 
In fact, negotiations are ongoing to achieve that end. Other influential parties have not yet declared their positions. As such, the Islamic Party of Iraq has not expressed its view about the upcoming elections. In addition, important political figures such as Iyad Alawi, Usma al Nujafi, Slah al Mutlaq, and others still have not taken a clear position. No one knows yet what these people will do in the upcoming elections. It seems that political parties are confused since the election laws have still not been decided. On. How can political parties form alliances if they still do not know how the voting will be carried out? Iraqi parliament leader Ayad al-Samarayi renewed his call to Iran to open water tributaries leading to Iraq. During a meeting with the Iranian president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in Tehran, al-Samarayi discussed several issues of common interest to both nations. Among the issues discussed were those of Iraqi prisoners and missing persons, as well as the redrawing of borders. The president of Iraq's Kurdistan region, Masoud Barzani, called on Dr. Barham Saleh to form the new regional government. Azad Barwari was appointed as deputy prime minister of the Kurdistan regional government, KRG. Barwari is a member of the political office of the Kurdistan Democratic Party. Saleh was appointed as the KRG's prime minister during an inauguration ceremony attended by government officials in the region. A number of officials from the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Patriotic the Democratic Union of Kurdistan also attended the inauguration. The new prime minister of the KRG has 30 days to elect his cabinet members. Joining us from Baghdad is Tanya Talate, Iraqi member of parliament and representative of the Kurdistan Alliance. Tanya, welcome. In your opinion, what is the percentage of votes won by each party? In addition to the two main parties in the region, several newly formed parties have won votes in the region for the first time. Good evening. The responsibility of forming the new government has been passed to the new prime minister, who was given 30 days to elect his cabinet members. There are ongoing negotiations to try to bring some smaller parties to join the new government. However, the vast majority of cabinet members will be chosen from the two main parties in the region. They're the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. There are many candidates under consideration for the ministerial positions. However, we must wait until Dr. Barham Saleh makes his appointment decision. A number of outstanding issues are still under debate between the central government in Baghdad and the KRG. Will the new regional government set to be formed by Dr. Barham Saleh be able to resolve these outstanding issues? Yes, this is what we expect to happen. The appointment of Dr. Barham Saleh to the position of prime minister was a wise decision. This will help improve relations between the central government in Baghdad and the KRG. I'm very sure that Dr. Barham Saleh will help resolve some of the outstanding issues between the central government and the region. The central government is responsible for helping the region meet its needs. Barham Saleh formerly served as the Iraqi deputy prime minister, so he knows how the central government functions. Barham is aware of some of the problems facing the central government in Baghdad. This qualifies him to mediate some of the issues facing the two governments, the central and the regional. Having said that, these are stalled issues and not a crisis. The political parties which partook in the Juba conference in Sudan announced their conditions for participating in the upcoming elections. These conditions include cancelling laws that restrict civic freedoms or amending them, as well as solving the problem of Darfur. They also demanded equal airtime on state-sponsored media and that the border between the south and the north of Sudan be specified. The participating parties gave the government until November 30th to implement these conditions. 
Decisions and recommendations made at the Juba conference came after four days of negotiations, adding a new chapter in the complicated history of Sudan. These recommendations, which were called the Juba Declaration for Dialogue and National Consensus, addressed the consecutive crises in Sudan and proposed a political roadmap in order to overcome these crises. Some of these recommendations are already known and were proposed previously. However, the participating parties in the Juba conference have specified five conditions for participating in the upcoming elections. A. Canceling the laws that restrict freedoms and violate the Constitution. B. Solving the problem in Darfur. C. Drawing the borders between the north and south of Sudan. D. Finding solutions for differences on how to count the population. And E. Diversifying the nationalities of those serving in the state's agencies, especially the media, by placing it under the supervision of the National Election Committee by November 30, 2009. The Sudan People's Liberation Movement expressed mixed views about the Juba Conference, which led its partner in the government's coalition to accuse it of conspiring with the opposition. As we had said in the beginning, the objective of this conference is not to conspire against any party. We want to discuss the problems in our country in a clear way. Although an announcement was made that the Juba conference had no agenda to form new political alliances, this did not stop the head of the National Democratic Union Party, who decided to come late to the conference after he had said that he would not participate. He demanded participating political parties to form a political alliance as the last resort to confront the ruling party. I call on participating parties to unite in the upcoming elections, not only to win the presidency of the republic, but also to change national legislations. We must unite. It seems that the participating political parties were very satisfied with the Juba Conference's final statements, which may lead to new alliances in the upcoming elections. The recommendations that were made in the Juba Conference, which were called by the participating parties, the Juba Declaration for Dialogue and National Consensus, establishes a new precedent on how opposition parties deal with the ruling National Congress Party pertaining to the internal Sudanese affairs, such as the elections and the right for South Sudan to self-determination. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.